Ken Laban joins us. Now, Lachlan was just saying to me, mate, um, he said, did Ken play league? And I said, oh, come on, son. He played centre for Wainui, champion, national champion side, Wainui. But you see, look, I mean, this is this is probably a lot of younger people probably don't remember that. They just probably think of you as a rugby caller these days. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, it's more country like ours. There are a lot of players. Um, as you know, we play, uh, play a multitude of sports, and especially in rugby union and rugby league, and we've seen that um, at the elite level with a lot of high-profile uh, players, Jerome Kinder, not many people know about Jerome, the background wow. in rugby league before he went to college. Of course, Roger Davis, um is another one. With Jerry Collins, we remember Jerry used to play. Jerry, Jerry Collins yeah. was another one. Jonah Lomu was another one. He was the back rower. Pity, of course. Pity, you know, um, um, uh, Pity was yeah, one of Pitty yours. Weepu. Yeah. Exactly. Hello, yeah. we're, we're talking to, we just spoken to uh, Melly Hofanga and um, and she plays rugby as well, and obviously in the Kiwi Ferns at the moment as as, as, as well. So yeah, these are things that not a lot of people know, that there actually is a lot, of cross, more, a lot more cross-code than actually perhaps people realise. Yes, exactly, and of course Tana Umang, probably the most high one. profile of all of them as well, who won a national championship with Wainui and played for the junior Kiwis as well before going to have a season of rugby union with his brother before his brother left to play in the UK and finished up staff degree and under all black captain. So uh, there are examples like that right across New Zealand, aren't they, in sport? Well, let's talk about the, the, the Rugby League World Cup final and the back-to-back. We've got the Kiwi Ferns playing Australia to start with, um, which is just going to be a cracking game. I mean, I watched in the highlights of that semi-final against England. Man, we've got a team that, you know, I think can take that out. And then, of course, you've got Tor Samoa versus Australia. We want to talk about that as well. But first, the Kiwi Ferns, mate. What's your thoughts? Yeah, well, the um, the Kiwi fans, of course, and the and the Australian team. So that is an all star game out of the NRLW competition, and um, the key players and the top sides that are involved in the NRLW dominate both the Kiwi teams um, and the Australian and the Australian women's team. A lot like um, the in, the in the men's game. Uh, as well, so I think it's a, it's a fantastic um, matchup. You know, gone are the days where um, Australia would just need to get off the bus and they would be guaranteed their win. Um, now they have a situation where the Kiwi girls and New Zealand girls are very much in demand um, in Australia, and of course they're all being coached by the same coaches, playing at the same level of competition and intensity, and that is a major factor in the ability of the Kiwi girls or the Kiwi team. To be um, to be more competitive, the fact that they're all playing in the elite competition. Ken, I don't like you know I don't I don't like comparing you know the sports and I don't and, I, and you know and I, and I and I and I don't like sitting there and saying hey this deserves as much publicity as that or whatever. But you know the Kiwi Ferns, I mean you know winning a World Cup to me, I mean that's the equivalent of any New Zealand side winning a World Cup when you've got a group of people going out there to win a World Championship for New Zealand. So I certainly hope it does get picked up and does get what it deserves. I mean this is a final. Yes, it is. Well, of course, it's in the Northern Hemisphere, so the time zone. Um, the time zone is a factor. Um, it is on Spark. You don't have any delayed coverage of it on um, on mainstream television. So um, it's played in the middle of the, in the middle of the night, a long time away. Unlike the wonderful experience we've just had over the last six weeks with the um, Women's with the World Black Cup, Ferns yeah. playing mm. at home. You know, it's been it's been fantastic. And if you haven't been able to get to the games with fantastic crowds, uh, you know, Spark and the deal that they did with TV3 to provide delayed free-to-air coverage, I think was a fantastic move. And that reflected also, in, you know, not only with their record attendances um, at the games physically in the stadium, but there, always, there was also record viewing audiences um, as well. So, you know, for the future of women's sport um, in, in New Zealand especially, I, I would think they'd take a lot of comfort out of that. And hopefully the, you know, the Kiwi... Uh, the, the Kiwi girls, by comparison, if they have to play more competitions at home in front uh, of home fans, they'll be able to build the same level of, um, of for their own brand. And then we've got the men's, of course, uh, us Kiwis against the Aussies. OK, we lost that semi-final. A Tor Samoa turning around a 60-point beating only three weeks before. And look, up here in Auckland, you've seen all the pictures as well, Mangari Ōtara. I mean, just fantastic, mate. We've got a gymnasium next to us, and half the crew who turn up here, they've got flags all flying out the back of their car. It's brilliant to see, eh? Oh, it is. Now, yeah, it's wonderful. And it's and it's a similar situation with the uh, with the Tongan team and the Tor Samoa 
um, team in either. <clears throat> and in spite of the fact that neither Jason Tomalolo or Andrew Fafita are taking the field um, in the final, their influence and their impact on Pacifica Rugby League can never be under <clears throat> can never be understated. Marty, it was those two boys that made the decision. These are two high-profile um, players that easily would have would have been selected for New Zealand and Australia, respectively. Both of them, when they were at absolutely the top end um, of their game and their playing, playing cause chose to represent Tonga, and as a result, uh, as a result of that, that started a um, that started a march. Um, for the players, um, similar players, to also make themselves available for a Tonga. And by the time they took the field at the last Rugby League World Cup in 2017 for Tonga, they had seven players in their starting lineup that had won an NRL premiership. And apart from one or two players out of the UK, um, 90% of their team came straight out of the NRL. And the Tors Hartmoor team is almost a replica of that same team. Five players that were in the Penrith team that... Um, that won a premiership back-to-back. And the fact that they chose um, to play for, for Samoa, and I've seen some beautiful um, one-off pieces to um, to camera that the boys have posted up on the website. Joseph Suwali is one example. The young kid, the hottest property um, in the game, and to take over eventually from James Tedesco at, um, at, the, at the Roosters. And this is the one moment in their careers that they could use to openly and publicly pay tribute to the heritage and to thank their families, they're all children of the migration. Um, and the fact that they've decided to, uh, to do this, I've seen a couple of shots inside the dressing room um, that they've posted on their social media uh, platforms as well. And there seems to be a, a beautiful culture and love and sense of understanding of what's there. Um, obviously, they didn't do it for the money. They've done it all, um, you know, for reasons that relate to their ancestry and their... Uh, um, and, and their heritage and stuff, yeah. It's yeah. all set up. Very nice. Matt Parrish said, and I love this quote from him, and look, you know, I mean, you, you, you could only say it if you're actually deeply involved with that team. He said, we're a little dot in the middle of the Pacific. And is that how you feel about it as well? I mean, what kind of pride does that fill you? You're in a World Cup final, mate. Well, mate, let, let me remind our listeners that um, Samoa is the population of Lower Hutt. Um, 200,000 people. You talk about a tiny dot up against Australia, the population. What's that? 22 million. Yeah. Um, so you know we're just a, we're we're a fraction of a fraction um, by comparison. And to be in the to be in the final, having this opportunity to play with a team capable of winning, is uh, is an enormous feat um, for them. And you know, when I put my emotional arm on, I'm so proud of those boys and what they've done. Uh, what they've done for Samoa and what they have done for the game. I think it's tremendous. Look, that's why I wanted you on because I just knew that you know, you'd, you'd be able to convey this and just to get across to people what you know how big a deal it is. This is why the flags come out at three in the morning. This is why people push each other in shopping trolleys up the street. I don't know what this is like, mate. I don't know what it's like to have parents that left their home, came to a different land, wanting a better life for their kids. That's what you're talking about with these players, isn't it? Because those kids have had that opportunity. They're making a better life. But for them to turn back around and go, Mum and Dad, we know what you did. That's an enormously powerful thing, Ken. It is. Well, I'm a child of the same migration. Uh, my, my, my parents, they left Samoa in their 20s. They, um, when they came to um, New Zealand, English was their second language. Uh, they, had no, they had no idea at all about what they were living themselves um, um, in for, um, away from culture, away from family, um, away from the familiarity of their, their upbringing. To start to start a new life um, in um, in another country, but they didn't know anybody. Um, and I used to, you know, not think about what they did and listening to my father read the newspaper out loud to try to practice his English. Wow. Um, early early in the morning, we now take for granted. And I think about, you know, it was in the in the 50s when they migrated. And I, you know, I often look at Google or what New Zealand was like when they came in the 50s, what the economy was like, what the makeup of the population. Um, was like because mum and dad used to talk to me all the time about things that <clears throat> we didn't we didn't regard it as racism we regarded it as normality back in the day in terms of what they had to overcome and the adversity and stuff that they had to deal with so you know um, and I think Ruby Tui has uh, has, out, has outlined some of that stuff in um, in her book that's just come out 
um, as well. So, you know, to see what these players have done um, to acknowledge ancestry and to acknowledge Samoa and, um, and, the, and the part that it's played in their life and in their families means a great deal. You know, sure, in, in football, at, well, at the end of the day, sport um, is a vehicle for them to be able to express that publicly. That's why there's that uh, wave of emotion. That's why the flags are out of there because we're not used to having our time in the limelight. We're not used to being playing in the uh, in the big finals. We're not used to being in the front of the papers for those kind of achievements. So, you know, it is it is a big deal when it comes um, to supporting and you know finally getting an opportunity to, to tell people who you are and how proud we are to be from the country that we're um, that we're all from. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to express that. Are we allowed to jump on the bandwagon, man? Can we all be tour Samoa for the weekend? You can, brother. We've known each other long enough for you to be an honorary Samoan forever. Oh, yeah, Carlos magic, Fuso. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks so much, mate. Love talking to you, dude. All the best. All right, mate.